a feast, a dripping roast, a cornucopia of topics on tonight's show, every one of which could sustain an entire show on its own. In the old days on TalkSport, in midsummer, I'd be thinking I'll have to throw in the dangerous dog subject, or maybe that old reliable should Margaret Thatcher get a state funeral. And then the switchboard would light up, uh, but it was a weapon that could only be used sparingly. There's only so much indignation you can muster on the subject of dangerous dogs. But so much indignation can I muster on this week's subjects. And so I think amongst you who are listening and hopefully even now reaching for the dial, uh, that it's difficult to know where to start. I will turn to the sublime, but let me start with the ridiculous. There was I, in the Grosvenor house, in winged collar and bow tie, with a tuxedo around my form, hugging Bobby Davro and Jim Davidson, the 70s and 80s comic geniuses. Odd enough, you might think, on a weeknight. But when I saw the table plan and discovered that I was sat next to Lord Nato himself, George Robertson, Tony Blair's defence minister, a man I've known for fully 45 years and have crossed swords with a thousand times, there I was crossing butter knives. And at the same table, I kid you not, within throttling distance was Britain's defence secretary, who's apparently called Gavin Williamson. Don't tell him your name, Pike! I shouted across, but nobody knew who he was, or therefore why I was saying it. And before long we were joined by a man that James Whale and I have just mutually anointed as the next leader of the Conservative Party, James Cleverly. And before a moment had passed, we were being invited to hold hands and sway to a rendition of the wind beneath my wings. Why were we doing this? Not since the Fox North Coalition, look it up, has there been such a disparate crew holding hands around a table. We were doing it for the clients of Care After Combat, HQ, that Jim Davidson runs, which is a charity for former military personnel who have fallen not just on hard times, a great many of them do that, but fallen into what is colloquially, euphemistically known as the justice system. I'm talking about ex-servicemen in jail. In jail because when they leave the armed forces, far too many of them fall into mental ill health, onto the streets, homeless, and thus, on both counts, into Britain's prisons, where many of them become recidivist, regular, repeat offenders. It's not a glamorous subject. It's not the kind of subject you can get Britain's popular newspapers easily involved in. But it's a gallant and noble one. And Jim Davidson and his mate Bobby Davro put on a dazzling show to raise a significant amount of money, significant enough at least. But given that Care After Combat are acting as a probation service, as a social services department, trying to create a path for offenders to return to normal living after an institutionalized period in the armed forces and then 
in the prisons. It's something the government itself has got to properly back. I'm glad to say there were no TV cameras that caught this moment, though I have tried to describe it to you as colourfully as I can, or at least as Jim Davidson will allow me. It was one of many surreal moments in a week as surreal as any in the recent past. There was the Tory chief whip tricking a pregnant MP who had been promised that such was her state of confinement that she would not have to come all the way down from Scotland to cast a vote that she was officially paired with a Conservative MP who would not therefore vote, both votes cancelling out themselves. I'm against the whipping system as a whole, and I've always been against pairing. It seems to me that you're there in Parliament to clash with your enemies, and the dice should fall as it falls. But that's not the prevailing view. The prevailing view is of a civilised House of Commons where the dead and the dying and those about to give birth or who have just given birth should not be dragged on the train down to Westminster when a solution is easily available of pairing them up with someone who will not vote to balance it. The Tory chief whip willfully not, as Theresa May said, as a result of an honest mistake, the chief whip has already admitted it was no mistake, honest or otherwise. It was a willful betrayal of the civilised norms of the House of Commons. And the government did it because its majority on a crucial matter pertaining to Brexit, was reduced to just three, and they were therefore ready to do anything. I suppose we should be grateful that it's not the house of cards, the mythical one, I mean, or someone might just have been pushed under a train to effect the relevant majority. But that's not all. A carefully staged, late-night, provocation was launched to trigger yet another coup against Jeremy Corbyn. When Jeremy Corbyn is three points behind, he has to go because he's a loser and Labour can never win with him. But when he's five points ahead and that no longer can wash what is he? Well, they've tried the lot. They've tried the KGB spy. They've tried the Czech spy. They've tried the IRA man. They've tried the secret Hezbollah Hamas agent. They've tried it all. And sometimes they try it twice. And thus, when Margaret Hodge, Dame Margaret Hodge, deliberately, in front of journalists, screamed in the face of the saintly, mild-mannered Jeremy Corbyn that he was an effing anti-Semite and a racist. Let me run that quote past you again. Jeremy Corbyn stood there in sackcloth and ashes, a candidate for beatification, to most of the land, was called by one of his own MPs in public, in Parliament, to his face, an effing anti-Semite and a racist. As the journalists leant over the banister, scribbling it down in the best Pittman's shorthand, a new coup was born. And I've just looked at the front page of the Jewish Chronicle, 
which in quotation marks, for libel reasons, my lord, has the following headline, quote, an anti-Semite and a racist atop a big picture of Jeremy Corbyn. And the dogs of war have been unleashed. Havoc has been cried. And we're off and running again. After Corbyn. And you know it's serious. When the biggest dog of war of them all. Salivating. Dripping in blood from his jaws. Tony Blair appears on Newsnight. And he was unequivocal. He drew a line in the sand. As did Chuka Umona. As did the familiar panoply of his gang. A line was drawn in the sand. If they touch one of the expensively quaffed barnet of the dowager, Dame Margaret Hodge, it's war, total war in the Labour Party. And the five-point lead will begin to dissolve in front of our eyes. Now, anti-Semitism doesn't just exist. It is a perennial danger because it is a form of racism that led to the greatest crime in human history in the lifetime of some people still alive today. And it originated in Europe. It originated with an Austrian. And this very day, the Austrian far-right government has announced that Jews in Austria, and presumably Muslims, will have to register if they want to go on buying kosher stroke halal meat. And as someone just tweeted, a Jew register in Austria, what could possibly go wrong? So I'm not here to in any way downplay the poison that is anti-Semitism. And I've just given you a real-life example from this day of anti-Semitism. But if you think that Jeremy Corbyn is an effing anti-Semite and a racist, then you are either listening to me from Ward 5 in Broadmoor or you're lying. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to everyone you say that to. Jeremy Corbyn is as far from being an anti-Semite and a racist as any human being walking on this earth could be. And you know it. This is not about Jews. Still less is it about the ancient, venerable, fundamental religion of Judaism. This is about Israel. It's about Netanyahu. And it's about his government's pronouncement yesterday, officially, that Israel is an apartheid state. Now, if that, if that wasn't enough to be going on with, Donald Trump has been to Helsinki and back again. He has declared Russia to be the best thing since sliced bread, only to return home, read the papers or have them read to him, and say that when he said the best thing, he actually meant to say the worst thing. He had misspoken. Except a day later, he announced he'd invited Vladimir Putin to the White House in just a few weeks' time. 
Again, what could possibly go wrong? And then, hallelujah. Charlie Rowley has risen like Lazarus from his tomb. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the salvation of the third of four victims of the deadly military-grade nerve agent called Novichok that was first a gel smeared on a doorknob and then a liquid sprayed from a perfume bottle. How these two utterly contradictory narratives can be squared only the great British media could tell us, but they won't, for they've already moved on. We're told, through the mouth of an unnamed press association journalist, quoting unnamed security service sources, that they have identified unnamed Russian GRU military intelligence operatives, four of them, one of them a woman, because they got to account for the perfume bottle, see, who flew in, killed the scripples, or rather didn't, and then flew out again. We'll never know, perhaps, how Mr. Rowley ended up with a perfume bottle full of military-grade deadly lethal nerve agent in his house and survived it. His poor partner did not. But there are some things that you can already state unequivocally from this story. And the first is, Vlad, your Novichok is no good. This multi, multi million pound program, this 10 year program that Boris Johnson said he had intelligence that showed you had embarked upon. 10 years, multi million pounds, Novichok assassination program fails on three out of four occasions. Vlad. Take it from me. A polythene bag over the head would be rather more effective and a very great deal cheaper. We may never know what the connection is between Mr Rowley and the Scripples. We may never know if Porton Down, Britain's own chemical and biological weapons, Laboratory and Research Centre. The clue is in the name, dear listeners. We may never know whether it was just one big coincidence that Mr Rowley lived three minutes' drive from Porton Down and the Scripples were struck just seven minutes' drive from Porton Down. One thing, though, I can tell you, and I can tell you without fear or equivocation, there may be a long list of suspects as to who carried out this crime. But on the simple principle of qui bono, who benefited the least and last on that list is the country the state and the intelligence services of the Russian Federation who have gained the least and lost the most from what we will now know forever as the Salisbury-Amesbury affair. And finally, Brexit. What a state we're in. Well, the government doesn't know where its next majority is coming from, which tried to pull stumps and dissolve Parliament five days early. In such terror are they of the open revolt 
there is now the Conservative Party. Now, I have told you for years that little woods are lucky I don't do the polls, even if the polls are any longer a thing. But I told you ad nauseum that Brexit would destroy the Conservative Party. And my goodness, is that a prediction that is coming true before our eyes. I'll say this, and here's my latest prediction. Before very long, I'm talking no more than the rest of this year, a new political system will arise in this country where the Blairite pro-EU wing of the Labour Party and the pro-EU wing of the Conservative Party and the odds and sods in the middle will coalesce as effectively a government of quote-unquote national unity. A national unity to betray the decision of 17.5 million British people to make a clean break with the European Union. And you know what? I really hope so. I'm Robin Finlay's back. All these weeks have passed since she was on this show and she's never once been coordinated with us until tonight. It's going to be a red letter night, I think. 0344 499 1000. That's the number to call. Now, Kevin Marr is a Ken Speckle figure on this show. We regularly have him on to talk about Ireland. And we will again this evening talk tangentially at least about Ireland vis-à-vis -vis the Brexit issue. But Kevin, as well as being the celebrated author of a wonderful book called A United Ireland, is a former creature of Westminster and Whitehall, a former special advisor. He knows what goes on in the corridors of power, or nearly power. I'm not sure how powerful some of the figures in this story uh, really are, but Kevin will be able to enlighten us. Kevin Marr, welcome back to the show. Good evening, George. Kevin, let me start with uh, Westminster and with the whipping yeah. and pairing row. Uh, I put my cards on the table earlier. I don't believe in pairing. Uh, it seems to me that the government should be opposed on every occasion and brought down if possible, that's the role of an opposition. And the principal yeah. beneficiaries of pairing are the government. I know that because when I entered Parliament in 1987, some of the richest Conservative MPs in Parliament were virtually, I stress virtually, offering me money to be their pair. Uh, Jonathan Aitken <laughs> reminded me that he had a very lovely yacht uh, that was mine whenever I wanted it if I was prepared to pair with him. And there were many other offers along those lines because the governing party is the one that simply has to be in the Commons all the time because the government can never afford to lose a vote, whereas the opposition almost always loses the vote. So I'm against pairing. But if you've got a pairing system, you've got to honour it, don't you? Oh, you do. I mean, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, George. There's, there's, there's an essential hypocrisy, if you like, about the House of Commons and, and the pairing arrangements that, that, you know, that, as you say, uh, government and opposition MPs pair up and agree in this kind of gentleman's agreement um, to, to absent themselves so that, uh, so that the, the, the votes kind of cancel out neatly. You know, the House of Commons is designed to be two drawn sort of lengths apart at the dispatch box and, and you know, one remove, it's there, it's ferocious, it's combative and uh, the other remove, it's uh, chummy and, um, and a little bit clammy, quite frankly. I think, I think the, uh, the arrangement principally affords uh, some MPs to uh, look off early, to go to the opera or whatever they do at night. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I think I think we're in we're in you know a a ferocious time in British politics. We've got a government that doesn't have an overall majority that is reliant on the Democratic Unionist Party. Um, you know, there there is a a very very strong likelihood that the government will fall. There is a strong likelihood there will be a general election. 
um, the, you know, the government is classically um, sort of soldiering on as, as best it can. So, 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 of course, if there's any threat to the pairing system and the integrity of it, which is exactly, of course, what we've seen um, this week, then that's absolutely disastrous for, for a sitting government. And, of course, this happened... Um, in the 1970s as well, as, as, as Jim Callaghan, of course, tried to hold on in power and in, in similar circumstances. And, of course, if, if there's any, any threat to, to the integrity where the government is seen to pull a fast one um, and not on the pairing system, then, you know, that it, it, frankly, it's at the end of its days um, come ever closer, I think. Now, you mentioned two words there that stood out. Uh, one was a gentleman's agreement and the other was the word integrity. Um, it's been... Uh, unmasked, isn't it, that we're really not dealing with gentlemen here and integrities in short supply. I'm always reminded of that remark of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson who said that the more a man talks of his integrity, the faster we should count our spoons. Mm. Um, and I think I think that's absolutely absolutely true here that, that um, you know, the government's got a very, very tough time getting its, 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 its fairly thin Brexit-related, um, obviously heavily Brexit-related um, legislative program through the Commons, and, and anything that that um, makes that now, I think, more difficult with, with the opposition, obviously crying foul, um, I think, legitimately um, about the the, the, the the shenanigans of the, of the, of the government whip's office, um, is, is is it really is classically shooting themselves in the foot? Um, you know, there was a, there was a great outcry, of course. As I mentioned, in, in, you know, 40 years ago, when accusations flew flew around of, of, of similar kind of behaviour um, in the Whip's office in the then Labour government in the, in the 1970s, and you know, it just it just really, I think, sets the seal on on any government's fortunes that if it if it if it seemed to um, stoop to sort of chicanery to, to, to try and hoodwink other MPs to get its legislation through. Um, you know, it's, it's 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 in a very poor place politically. No, the I'm majority. Uh, right, Ke- the pairing should come. Yeah, Kevin, the the DUP majority, uh, um, who do provide the majority, are now depleted uh, yeah. by the unprecedented ban on Ian Paisley Jr., who failed to declare one hundred thousand pounds worth of free holiday given to him and his family by the government of Sri Lanka. I must say, I cannot conceive of a holiday, or two it was, uh, that uh, could cost £100,000 unless unless uh, uh, diamonds are being bedecked uh, upon you. I don't know how you reach that figure. Tell us uh, how that's gone down, will you? I think I think that would that would be quite a mini bar bill, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Y- yes. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 I think it's partly illustrative, and you know, not to be too overtly political about this, but there's a very different, uh, more freewheeling culture about uh, privacy in, in Northern Ireland politics, and particularly the Democratic Unionist Party. Um, and you know, this is a severe sanction from the House of Commons um, for Ian Paisley, who, as you say, took. Uh, him and his family on, on you know, a, I think two uh, luxury holidays to Sri Lanka. I mean, interestingly, an, an anagram of Ian Paisley is "I nap easily," um, and that's what you would do on uh, in first class, uh, first class uh, um, but, but, but I think what it does, obviously, at a remove, is for the next for the next month at least, which in parliamentary terms is a very tough sanction. He's banned from the House of Commons, which depletes the DUP's representation there from ten to nine, which again, you know, just makes. Theresa May's position even more tenuous, where she's got, you know, a party that's bag- badly balkanised on, on on the Brexit issue. You know, with with, with you know sixty to eighty really tough um, hard Brexiteers and and an indeterminate number of people on the on the, on the pro European Remain side that that you know who are frankly having the same kicks in their face on a regular basis, and she's got to try and meld all this together. Um, with no overall majority reliant on the unionists who've got their own very specific take clearly on, on, on Brexit um, anyway. Um, he's got to try and meld all this together and, 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 and get it passed, really, passing legislation to effect a policy, Brexit, which she campaigned against just two years ago. So we're in very, very strange times. Very strange uh, indeed, uh, if one were biblical, uh, would think they were the end times. Uh, the um, uh, Irish border... Uh, arose again. I'll come back to Westminster in a minute, but uh, staying in Ireland for a minute, uh, the Chequers caravan is now without wheels, isn't it? Barnier has uh, rejected uh, the uh, principal um, 
pillars of the Chequers Agreement, even if there was a majority for it in the Commons. And one of the main issues uh, on it, uh, uh, leading to that, is the is the Irish uh, border with Britain. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Theresa May spent um, the last two days in Northern Ireland visiting the border um, to, ha- to have a look at it, um, which is a slightly strange fourth opportunity. Um, and then she made yeah. a, a speech in, in, in Belfast this morning. Now, I mean, the speech itself, I was just reading it just just before coming on. I mean, it's, most of it is a recitation of things that she said before with a few specific remarks um, briefed out to, to, to provide the news hooks, if you like, for the day. But, I mean, what, what, she's, what she's doing or, or what she's not doing, really, is... is Setting the, the setting the ground for a compromise. I mean, every political deal, you know, you know, this is far better than I, George. Every political deal ultimately ends up in some form of compromise. The Good Friday Agreement, of course, is a classic example of that. But what Theresa May is doing is, is, is seemingly trying to still go around placating all her audiences, all her internal audiences, clearly the DUP are the, are the primary audience for today. Um, but all it does is put off the moment where, frankly, there will be some compromise that she will have to arrive at if she wishes to avoid a hard Brexit scenario. Um, the rhetoric um, is, is, is still, you know, we can get a deal. There won't be a hard border at all. I've given that commitment. But in the fine detail, of course, it's all completely contradictory. And I think this is, this is, the, this is the reaction really from, from, from the European Commission and the Irish government over the last couple of days, the Irish government, the Irish foreign minister, Simon Coveney, has basically put a line out saying it's still incumbent upon Theresa May to spell out in detail how she's going to make all this work because that detail does not match the rhetoric. Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator for Brexit, um, you know, has talked about um, the, the British government's positions need to be workable. Now, I think you can read into that in diplomatic speak that he thinks they are unworkable. Um, so there's, there's still a long way to go, it seems, to be able to get these two positions on the same on the same page about how we arrive at a situation where there is there is no hard border along that 310 demarcation between Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland, and that there is no there is no friction in terms of cross cross border trade and free movement of people. But at the same time, you're going to have two different jurisdictions. You're going to have two different um, two different uh, Customs and tariff regimes, you know, it's entirely contradictory, and and you know, this is still the, the, the fundamental issue that's that's holding up Britain negotiating um, a, a successful ejection from from the European Union. And of course, this was the issue that, you know, that Tory ministers and Theresa May thought was a walk in the park. They thought this was the easy thing to to resolve. We'll sort that out. That's no problem. And of course, here we are, 18 months later. Um, frankly, not a lot further forward than we were 18 months ago, with with proposals that come forward, um, which are then deemed to be unworkable. Now, interestingly, in her speech today, um, Theresa May was emphatic, but and I just quote this very quick, quick line that there's no technolo- no, no, no technology solution to address the the, the border arrangement. It's not been, there's nothing similar imp- implemented anywhere in the world. She put it now. Of course, this idea that there was a technological solution to managing the border was one of the kind of regular um, claims of, of David Davis, her recently departed Brexit secretary. So I suspect she's tweaking his nose a little bit there. But and the Boris Johnson uh, too, because Johnson, uh, really, he, he yeah. made a similar point uh, in his absolutely. speech. I mean, what we what we've seen is these kind of throwaway lines. Oh, we'll sort it out. Don't worry about it. And in the fine detail, you know, the the the, the claim is never 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 substantiated. Now, what Theresa May, as, 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 you know, her big line really is is that um, Northern Ireland is as British as the rest of the UK, as, as, as part of an integral part of the UK, and should be treated in exactly the same way. That there can't be any any effective any shared sovereignty, which is of course flying in the face of recent history. Margaret Thatcher in 1984 signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which gave the, the, the Irish Republic um, a, you know, a, a significant say in the affairs, particularly around security, of, of Northern Ireland. And, of course, that was, a, that was a fulcrum upon which we then built the Good Friday Agreement, which did exactly the same mm. thing. So, so, so Theresa May is being kind of, I think, you know, I think being utterly simplistic uh, in trying to placate the DUP audience today. But all she's doing is putting off that day when, frankly, there's got to be compromise there's got to be some arrangement here that puts the interests of Britain and the British economy 
ahead of ahead of the, the, the niceties of, of 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 Northern Ireland's particular status. Yes, except I mean, being half an Irishman myself, I'm entitled to say, as the Irishman famously said when asked the way somewhere, "Oh, I wouldn't have started from here." <laughs> Uh, the the only they're hoist on this petard because the only solution is to draw the border in the middle of the Irish Sea, and yes. they can't do that without killing the idea that the six counties in the northeast of another country are as British as Brighton or Bogna. Uh, that yeah. th- these two things cannot be squared. This is this is the this is the great difficulty. I mean, the, the simplistic, the, the, the easiest way of dealing with this is to effectively keep Northern Ireland. Don't have a hard border because there's, there's all kinds of political, symbolic, and security issues. Never mind all the all the trade issues. Keep keep um, keep Northern Ireland in the customs union, in the single market, um, and then have that border effectively um, enforced at the, at, the, at, the, at the Irish Sea embarkation points on the, on the island of Ireland. That's the simplest administrative way of, of, of getting around this. But, of course, what that does is that there's huge symbolism there where, in effect, you know, you have a kind of Northern Ireland governed, as, you know, in, huge, in large measure as part of a single island settlement, which, of course, is inimical to what colonialism is about. But yeah, the, uh, the, uh, she'd the, lose the them. She'd, she'd lose all nine of them uh, or ten when Paisley comes back. Uh, if this, she this if it. she did the only thing that actually does achieve a proper Brexit for Britain. Yes, and I think this is this is the I think this is absolutely the fundamental point, George. That Northern Ireland constitutes around one and a half percent of the UK's economy, and here we are with the real prospect of no deal and a hard Brexit. And all the, all, whatever your views are on Brexit, all the uncertainty that that will bring is going to be disastrous with business and investment and all the rest of it. And really, what, what Theresa May needs to be saying to her party, needs to be saying to the Brexiteers, is that if we end up with a no-deal scenario, we run out of time and, and things run into the sand, then, and we leave on bad terms, and if the economy goes off the cliff... What will happen is that Brexit will not be sustainable. What will happen is the pendulum will swing back the other way and we'll be back in the European Union at some stage within the next five to ten years. So it's in Brexiteers' own interests. This is the argument I think she should make to them. It's in their own interests that we that, that, that they, they accept a Brexit that may have some messy entrails that drag along behind it. Well, that is better than having a hard Brexit which just will ride off a cliff and just open the door for, for a readmittance and reapplication to join the European Union under a fresh government perhaps in five or ten years' time. And I think, I think it's about taking on this kind of, this kind of slightly imperialist, uh, right-wing, Tory, romantic sort of section of their party and saying, you guys need to wake up and, and smell the coffee and look ahead and be able to future-proof the Brexit you want because otherwise, otherwise um, you, know, you, may be, you may find yourselves... Looking at looking at you know within five or ten years of Britain back in, in in the European Union and of course the parallel here is is 1962 when when Macmillan originally tried to join the then EEC and was rebuffed by De Gaulle and of course Harry Wilson then won in the 60s and we took the economy in a different way by 1972 we were in the EEC you know so, so, so I, I suspect something similar may happen that that we that, that that we leave we take a different course that course doesn't work and then the the best option on the table is to rejoin the european union so i think i think brexiteers need to need to be able to look ahead 5 to 10 years and ask themselves is 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 their course of is, is their course of action today going to actually sustain a brexit that they want to see in the long term well there's no de gaulle to say non uh, but I expect there would be 27, a babel of uh, uh, European languages shouting no in in Bulgarian, Slovakian, Romanian, etc. <laughs> Kevin Marr, a pleasure as always uh, to have the path illuminated by you. Kevin Marr, author of A United Ireland. The switchboard is lighting up. It's been a while, but he's back. Here's Doogie. From Eastern Hello. Dougie, welcome back. Hello, George. Tell me. Uh, the question I'd like to ask you, as a Brexiteer, like yeah. I am, and you are, yeah. why do you want the government to fall when Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party don't want us to Brexit? I don't believe that's true, and I believe that Theresa May doesn't want us to Brexit, and everything that she's done has been to wreck Brexit. 
So okay. I want the Tories to fall for all kinds of reasons, uh, and Brexit is one of those reasons. But I believe that Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, and the other left-wing leaders of today's Labour Party know that continued membership of the European Union renders their political and economic programme in the best case very much more difficult and in the worst case impossible for them to carry out. So I, I put my faith in a Corbyn Labour government giving us the Brexit that we need and that we deserve. What the one, the, the one, the, their policy is that we stay in the customs union and no, stay in the single market. But it isn't. Uh, it's not uh, that. That isn't Labour's policy. Neither it of is those. George. No, neither of those. Uh, you it said. Is. Uh, I'll tell you why you're wrong. Because you said the word ah, uh, uh, the rather. It's not the. It's ah. I've got a bad throat, George. I do apologise. That's all right. But it, there is a difference between our customs union uh, and the customs union. The customs union is the pre-existing. Customs Union and Labour is against being in that. They want to ex- make another Customs Union. One that doesn't... Can you explain to me Labour's stance on Brexit, please? Well, I'm not a spokesman for the Labour Party. I'm not even in it. I'm not even in it, uh, Doogie. Uh, the point, though, is Labour are not in power. Uh, and therefore, the only real debate that matters no. is what are the government? What are the government... Oh, no. Sorry, yeah, did something point... happen there, Dougie? Yeah, my dog's going mad. Oh. Another point I'd like to make to you, George, is yeah. I keep hearing constantly on the media, as you do, about the Tory majority. Yeah. Right, now, the point I'd like to make is, is that Parliament has a Brexit majority and it's the Labour Party that are going to stop Brexit happening. No, I don't think Parliament does have. In fact, I, 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 I significantly assert that neither House in Parliament has a Brexit majority. There then. is 133 Labour MPs that represent Leave constituencies. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's a, and that, there's only four or yeah. five that no. vote with the government. Yeah, that, that's a different so matter. Parliament uh, that, does that, have that, that, a majority Brexit no, no, majority. No, that, I mean, that's sophistry. Uh, no, the, the vast majority of Labour MPs are anti-Brexit, but 70% of Labour constituencies, Labour-held parliamentary constituencies, voted for Brexit. And that's why Jeremy Corbyn will never betray it. Corbyn will never betray Brexit for that reason. George... 133 Labour MPs mm-hmm. represent Leave constituencies. Why are they constantly vouching against Brexit? Because they're against Brexit. As you very well know, in our parliamentary system, the MP is a free agent in Parliament, so much so that Corbyn can't even get uh, 100-plus Labour MPs to support the Labour Party's line on many important issues. But the thing is, the, the, everybody keeps blaming the Tories, or this, that, and that, and they keep ignoring the fact about the Labour Party, about the Labour Party and their MPs. But it's not Labour's. They're constantly voting down Brexit. Dougie, it's not Labour's job to get the Tory government's measures through the House of Commons. No, no it's the Labour MP's job to fulfil what they got voted in on, no, it, regardless it, of the party that's in charge. No, no, I mean, that's turning, British, George, that's turning, the, turning the British Constitution on its head. We have a Tory government. If they can't get their measures through Parliament, they must leave. No, yes. I think this has gone beyond Tory and Labour now. It's about the country. But you know very they well... No, no, no. You, you know very well how the British system works, even though you're living in Israel. You know the British system very well. It's the government's job to pass its own measures. It's not the leader of the opposition's job to help the government no, pass its no. own measures. George, the point is, it's about the country, not party politics anymore. Well, there is 133 Labour MPs mm. that sit and represent Leave constituencies, yeah, and the vast and majority they of them constantly vote yeah, against the government yeah, because that's they are against Brexit. They're against Brexit. That's the but point they, I'm trying to make vouch- to you. They, they, every Labour MP got voted in the same 
as yeah. the Tories. Look, I agree with you. I, I'm a Brexit supporter. I believe that the the great well, majority. I, I, I believe the great. Stuff. I believe the great majority of Labour MPs are traitors, not just on Brexit, but on many other things. Many, many other things, uh, including well, things you and I don't agree about. Uh, but you can't. I mean, a ship's captain can't complain about the sea. The sea is the sea. It's there. You have to get across it. And the Tories threw away their parliamentary majority on a needless general election because they thought they were going to wipe Jeremy Corbyn off the map. And they catastrophically and fatally miscalculated, didn't they? Agreed. So but that's why we're in this boat. I'll keep, I'll keep banging on about it. It is the Labour Party that is going to stop Brexit from happening. And no, I'll keep saying it. I don't think that's right. I was I alive about even within your years, terms, George. Even within your terms of your argument, I don't believe that that's true because Labour voted to trigger Article 50. Indeed, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, on the very first day, called for it to be uh, implemented immediately. Uh, so why the, does he keep the, going against uh, every not, amendment? You've, your quarrel's not with Corbyn. Your quarrel is with the Labour benches behind Corbyn. But anyway, Dougie, that'll have to be the end of it for tonight, but I hope you'll be back next week because despite everything, we've missed the dulcet tones of eastern Beirut, although he's actually in western Jerusalem. Now in another Britain, a better Britain, and I pray that we reach there before he's too old, my next guest would be a member of a Senate or an upper house in the British Parliament. He's the professor of children's literature. He's every father, mother, grandfather and grandmother's favourite children's author. I have myself a house full of his work. He's Michael Rosen and he joins me now. Michael, welcome to the show. Good evening, George. Now, we both know uh, Jeremy Corbyn very well uh, and we both know uh, that he's not an effing anti-Semite and he's not a racist. So why do you think Margaret Hodge, Dame Margaret Hodge, no less, in Parliament, in front of journalists, shouted that in his face the other night? Well, it is very peculiar. She's known Jeremy for 40 years, I should think, at least. And I don't think she's ever levelled that allegation at him ever before. And if she really does think that, then the way to do that would be to raise it through the instruments in the Labour Party or in private. So that sort of strange, what seems to have been like a shouty thing, got, went on behind the Speaker's chair in the House of Commons. It was obviously a, a, a political demonstration on her part. She wanted it to be noticed and she wanted the whole press to see it because we have a battle royal on at the moment. What is quite clear to me is that there are people in the Labour Party, I'm not in the Labour Party myself, but uh, the, the Parliamentary Labour Party, who would rather uh, the Labour Party was split than for Corbyn to win. And there is, in their eyes, a great danger, uh, in my eyes, a great hope, that Corbyn might win an election if the Tories go on eating each other, which is what they're doing at the moment. So uh, having consumed each other over a period, it's might quite possible the, uh, the government would collapse and somebody would have to call an election, perhaps the Queen. Who knows how it's done. But, uh, and the great fear for the Margaret Hodge wing of the Labour Party, or the remnants of the, uh, the old Blair government and, a, a few, and the, new one, the new ones like Chukaramuna and so on, they, they, they're getting ready to split. I mean, I can tell you on very, very good evidence that prior to uh, Theresa May calling that snap election, uh, Alistair Campbell was ringing up people in television and others saying, would you like to be an MP in this new party I'm about to form? Yes, so, I predicted that myself in my indeed. talk up uh, in the beginning, and we'll come back to that, Michael. Um, so I think Margaret Hodge was, in a sense, uh, she was raising a banner for this, whatever you want to yes, call it, third yes. way, eighth way, new way, old way, whatever it is. And she was raising the standard for that and saying, this is what we're doing. And one of the ways we're going to do it is to claim that somehow or other Corbyn and uh, people around him are raving anti-Semites. I uh, first thought it was late at night. Uh, some of these MPs, like a, a glass of champers or a bottle or two, and that it was some kind of aberration, uh, some kind of regrettable incident, 
uh, that could be uh, massaged uh, past. Uh, but she then took to the Guardian uh, and said that she stood by her action and her words. So she does, in the cold light of day, regard Corbyn in these vile uh, terms. And that speaks to the point you've just made, that this was a carefully considered, at least carefully considered after the fact, if not before, a carefully considered, I call it a provocation. Mm. Oh, yes, no. And more than that, it's orchestrated in how she has presented herself. So she presents herself, quite rightly, as many Jewish people of Jewish background present themselves at all times, reminding everybody, as we do, me too, that uh, our relatives, quite close relatives, suffered grievous, grievous harm uh, during the Holocaust. Now, when you do that in an argument, when you accuse somebody of being an anti-Semite, you, in a sense, sort of draw them in to this whole terrible set of events that took place in Germany and Europe between 33 and 45, and you draw them into it, and somehow, by, by connotation, by, by attachment, if you like, that somehow or other it's implicated, that because they're, you, you first of all claim they're anti-Semites, and somehow they're joined to this terrible thing that happened. So again and again, when the, when the story was presented in the news, you heard that uh, Margaret Hodge was the veteran MP who herself had suffered, uh, her family had suffered under the, in the Holocaust. Now, is this the same Margaret Hodge, say, for example, that the editor of the Jewish Chronicle described in the Daily Express in 2015 as by saying she drags the entire political system into disrepute, she would now be well advised to withdraw from public life, that wherever she is, she, she, uh, she shows her sheer grubbiness. She's so suffused with her own righteousness that she thinks she is above the standard she would impose on mere mortals. She shows jaw-dropping hypocrisy. She's too fat, and so on. And prior to it that, is indeed the same, uh, and it's the same Margaret Hodge that Stuart Stevens took a whole page in the Evening Standard to denounce in in uh, in uh, similar terms. But the media tune has changed, doesn't it? Well, we're supposed to forget, George. The point is, we're supposed to have one week memories. So. You know, the fact that this woman who at one time, you remember way back when she was described as an Islington lovey and that somehow or other was all part of the loony left. Then there was this uh, other phase in her life where she was, you know, which she herself described, she managed with uh, shameful naivety. We won't go into it just now in case we step on some toes. But then there was another whole issue of when she appeared to be behaving very well in the uh, standards committee, in the auditing committee. But it then turned out that in actual fact, she was guilty of the very things that she was accusing others of. Yes. So there have been several phases in the life of Margaret Hodge. But we're supposed um, to forget them. And we're supposed to forget them. We're only supposed to have a week in the life of anybody. So she's moved from this kind of loviness into a kind of Jewish Joan of Arc, that we're somehow or other she is this sort of poor, martyred figure, and therefore again gives validity to this outrageous, just sheer shouty match uh, behind the speaker's chair, all right, and then that then then is somehow evidence because of her Holocaust, the Holocaust background that many of us have, me included. The, that is somehow evidence that she must be right. The same woman who, as I say, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle could describe as as, as totally hypocritical and be well advised to withdraw from public life. Well, she hasn't withdrawn from public life. No, on the contrary, she's right yeah. now bang centre uh, mm. to it. Now, I think you pointed out on Twitter uh, that uh, that people who are related to Holocaust victims, in some cases children, grandchildren, close relatives, murdered by fascism uh, throughout Europe in the 33 to 45 period, are only really allowed to bring that up if they hate Jeremy Corbyn. If they are people, as many are, who actually like Jeremy Corbyn, like you, who have a similar background, uh, they're not allowed, they're never given that uh, credibility, uh, speaking as the, sur the relatives of survivors of the Holocaust? It, it's, it seems not, that those, those of us for whom that has happened, um, and when we say that, it's, we, I'm not described as someone, you know, someone whose family uh, who, who suffered the Holocaust supports Jeremy Corbyn. That's yeah. like, that sounds like very odd, doesn't it, to yeah. our ears? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's never been heard. It's, it's, not, it's not heard. So the way it's heard is that when you accuse Jeremy Corbyn of that, it gives credence to what you're saying. Somehow or other, she is a more credible witness. 
right? This is this is what's being claimed in the yes, papers. Yes, yes. And, and Chuka Mona and others uh, leapt into print uh, to make that very point in, in her defence. I may say, I should say, that even Blair doesn't say that Corbyn is an anti-Semite and a racist uh, on Newsnight last night, as he was he predictably. Didn't. He, he stepped He stepped aside he from stepped that one. Aside I mean, from it, that. he's also outside of Parliament. So, of course, the, the people are scooting yes. around various issues around libel and defamation. Yes, 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 yes. quite, quite. He was, so he was being very, very careful. But now, then, you also, I think it was you, uh, it was good enough to be you, uh, made the point uh, earlier today that when Corbyn is behind in the opinion polls, he's a loser. Uh, yeah. When he's ahead in the opinion polls... Uh, he's an anti-Semite and a racist. That's and it. Well, he's moved miraculously from being the incompetent geography teacher to some kind of Nazi warlord. <laughs> so it is just like extraordinary, the kind of transformation, because, again, this it is, is remarkable, Fred. especially it's, as we it's, know him so well. Creating these constructs is creating like a sort of Lego factory around somebody, a sort of Lego castle where you say one minute they're one thing and then you hope that people have forgotten that you were laughing at the fact that he had a jacket that was like a bit worn at the edges and that now you're claiming that he's sort of running some sort of Nazi clique. Yeah. So they kind of flip-flop like that. And somehow or other, we out there, we're supposed to believe these kind of manufactured uh, stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll I mean, see, uh, I suppose, uh, in, in the next polls. They're certainly trying hard enough. Let me move on, Mike, if I can, mm. to um, what comes next, because I agree with you. And indeed, I said so at the beginning of the show, uh, that there's no way back from this, really. If you see the front page of the Jewish Chronicle today uh, and you survey the last uh, 40 hours of coverage, it doesn't seem to me there's any way back from this. Corbyn cannot allow this to stand. And Blair made it clear enough, as have many others, like Chuka, uh, that if any action is taken against the Dowager... Uh, that uh, that there will be severe consequences inside the Labour Party. So I do think that this is the cause celebre uh, around which this new political force is going to be born. Now, although neither of us looks it, we were both around when this happened before mm. and the <laughs> SDP uh, mm. was formed. Mm. Do you think it'll be the same kind of thing, people breaking away, sitting as perhaps an independent group, or do you think Alistair Campbell's got a name and a HQ and a bank of telephones uh, ready for something actual, concrete and new? Well, we've got two or three things all going on at the same time that confuses us, so that I guess, and I'm, I'm as confused as anybody else. So we have the whole, obviously, the Brexit remain, the soft Brexit, the hard breakfast, the breakfast, the, the, the cold breakfast, the cold, <laughs> the cold Brexit. We've got all that going on. <laughs> with many fracturings on all sides, with a government propped up by a group of people whose views that if people just knew, you know, we're, we're not just talking about creationists, you know, we're talking about people who are bigots. We're talking about people, I'm talking about the DUP now, we're talking about a form of anti-Semitism that goes utterly unremarked, namely two or three of their DUP members are, are a form of, uh, believe in a form of Christian Zionism where all Jews, in other words, the Jews, which is often regarded as a very prejudicial way of talking, should all move to Israel where we'll be converted to Christianity or put to the sword in order that the second coming might happen. Now, we can laugh at that and say, well, this is just the fantasy of some fundamentalists. This is the same lot of people who, who prop up Trump in America with massive amounts of money and support and voting in the key states and the same thing is going on in this country, propping up uh, Theresa May's government and indeed turning up at the anti-Semitic anti rallies, alleged anti-Semitism rally, enough is enough. There they were, two of these DUP guys. And these are the people propping up the government at this very moment. It's teetering on the balance. That form of anti-Semitism never mentioned. And meanwhile, Stephen Pollard, editor of the Jewish Chronicle, is calling on the Jewish MPs to leave to create a new party. I don't know whether he is, in all seriousness, meaning that they should have a vote Jewish party, or I, I don't know, but it seems like bizarre that he's inviting the Jewish members of parliament, I think there are about 10, um, to, to leave. And meanwhile, Chuka, who's made a play for the last two years to be the leader of this group, you know, every statement that I ever see him make, it's always done with a kind of 
ultimatums and the sort of when the pre it's like a kind of foreplay isn't it it's a kind of leadership foreplay that goes on of the of the sort of positioning and meanwhile behind the scenes Campbell and Blair are live and well I mean you know we, we watched 20 minutes of a Blair interview on Newsnight last night I mean it was like a sort of laying on of hands virtually indeed yes now what so I can I, tell I, you I have he... a feeling uh, sorry sorry to no. you, George I have a feeling quite genuinely that they they will take an opportunity like this to to walk out in some form or another uh, whatever parliamentary system they'll use renouncing the whip I mean after all uh, Woodcock, John Woodcock has already gone yeah. uh, without resigning so he's in a sense utter contempt of his constituents and just said I'm resigning, why do, do his constituents, do his parliamentary Labour Party think that was a good idea? He didn't say, he just went um, and this is the man who does what is regularly called by Jewish people goysplaining, where the uh, goy is a, a word meaning non-Jewish, and you do instead of mansplaining, they do goysplaining, stand in front of Jews and tell them what's wrong with them yes. and what they should be doing. So yes. Woodcock does a lot of that. Well, and, and indeed they declare some people to be good Jews and some bad. Let me oh, tell you... Oh, oh indeed. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the bad ones. So it's a form of anti-Semitism that's not in called itself, anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I've got breaking news for you because it's just dropped. Uh, an emergency motion has been tabled uh, to amend the standing orders of the Parliamentary Labour Party. The emergency motion stands in the name of Louise Elman and Ruth Smith. Yes. And it is that the Parliamentary Labour Party standing orders be amended as follows, with immediate effect, that the Parliamentary Labour Party accepts and abides by the full International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, including all of its accompanying examples. Now, this has been tabled. Uh, if the Parliamentary Labour Party passes it, a constitutional crisis will then exist uh, between the national executive of the party and the PLP uh, because it's their contention that whatever are the standing orders of the Parliamentary Labour Party must, and they've accentuated the word must, be endorsed by the NEC. I myself would have a different uh, definition of the word must there. Uh, mm. I, would, I would argue that that word in that context means that those new standing orders could not be in effect unless they had the endorsement of the National Executive Committee. But that may be the end of a needle uh, around which there'll be a bit of dancing and a final severance. Maybe, but I mean, you know, this, talking of dancing on needles or dancing on pins or whatever, I mean, this whole thing, this, this definition of anti-Semitism, you know, it's a great cumbersome document. And I've, I've read an article today in The Guardian by Brian Klug, a philosophy uh, professor and indeed Jewish himself, who says that the reason why the, 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 the way the, it's been uh, phrased by the way the Labour Party has phrased it is a good way of doing it. And as the people have argued about it, they've changed some, some of the words and there's four, that the Labour Party, four clauses, four examples that the Labour Party have taken out. The problem is with the whole thing. I mean, it's a shame, in a way, I think, that the Corbynites have, the Corbynistas have allowed themselves to be hung out to dry on this thing because they're trying to draw into the idea of anti-Semitism. The, the basic principle of anti-Semitism, when people are arguing about it, is: is do you dislike? Are you hostile to? Do you hate Jews because they're Jews? That's the that's the solid core of what anti-Semitism is, and that is a form of prejudice prejudice, prejudicial speech and writing. But there is also discrimination. And what makes me fed up is the fact that we so easily slide between these two things. So there we have the Windrush scandal. Here is an example of discrimination. People's lives ruined and wrecked by racist legislation and racist activity by the immigration authorities, which have fundamentally affected people's lives, livelihoods, state of mental health, and indeed, in some occasions, probably driven to early death. That's discrimination. And then we have prejudice, where we say foul things. I say to you, George, you are foul and horrible because you are Scots. That is prejudice. Yes? yes? That's prejudice. Now, of course, that is revolting and horrible. But this, this whole uh, 
code that had come in, it is not only prejudice about you as a Jew because, and we know all the old tropes about what Jews are or supposedly are, it's about what you say about a foreign power. And this foreign power, obviously, we don't have to mince words, is the state of Israel. So suddenly we now have an extraordinary code of practice where if you say something horrible about a foreign state, you are therefore being prejudicial to Jews, you are being anti-Semitic. This couldn't hold up in a court of law anywhere. If I said something horrible about Iceland, or I say something horrible about America, or Canada, or you name the country, you know, so long as I'm not actually provoking a hate crime, but I'm just saying, let's imagine the place is called, okay, it's Ruritania, and I say, oh, Ruritania, it's terrible, they do awful things to people in Ruritania, and then that's not going to stand up in a court of law. So we have a code of practice that only works inside institutions about barring people as to whether they can belong or not. Well, fine, institutions need codes of practice, but the idea that it should depend on what you say about a foreign power, an irony of ironies, this week that foreign power has passed legislation that is discriminatory against 1.8 million of its own, uh, the people, its own citizens. It's passed legislation. I mean, you couldn't make it up. You know, that in the very week that this happens, we're debating whether you should say something nasty or not about this country. I mean, in fact, there are people in the state of Israel at the moment, liberal Zionists, saying stuff about Israel, that if you said it here now inside the Labour Party, you get chucked out. Exactly so. Uh, the Haaretz uh, leader writers would be, would be witch hunted out of the Labour Party for what they're writing every day. Yeah, there's an article in the Washington Post this week by a guy who describes himself as an Israeli-American, who's obviously a liberal Zionist, who is absolutely appalled with the state of Israel. He can hardly hold himself back from saying stuff about Netanyahu and about the state of Israel and the fact that, you know, the way it discredits Israel and the way it draws it, you know, drawing into his, 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 his if you like, his attack on, on the state of Israel. He's not using classic anti-Semitic tropes, of course not. But at the same time, He's describing Israel in a way that people say, well, that sounds like singling out Israel. You remember, this is one of the things... It's in one the of the code. examples, yeah. If you, so, so, in fact, even now, right, imagine if I was in the Labour Party, I've singled out Israel, so I better stop now, and I better talk about Ruritania, America, Britain, um, and uh, Egypt. Quickly. Even though we do all the time, in, in any case. So that I'm not singling it out. Uh, in any case, we don't single it out. Indeed. We attack Saudi Arabia... On an hourly basis. Indeed. What has Jeremy said, unlike almost any other politician in the last 20 years has said, in his position, that we can no longer go on selling arms to Saudi Arabia. We must reach a new arrangement with Saudi Arabia. It cannot go on doing this because yeah. Saudi Arabia is engaged in a war and we're, by proxy we're involved in that war as well. But also, you know, we've, we've, we've in a sense indirectly been involved in some of the lines of of terrorism that have originated in Saudi Arabia, that we've been proxy in that as well. And this is an appalling relationship to be in, and Jeremy Corbyn has actually stood up about that, whereas, you know, bar one or two backbenchers, to their credit, on both sides of the House who've said it, and Jeremy when he was in fact a backbencher, but front benches absolutely consistently, consi absolutely consistently have backed the relationship between the UK and Saudi Arabia. So when we say singling out Israel, well, you know, the Saudis probably think that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn has singled out Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Professor Michael Rosen, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. 0344 499 1000. You call us, we'll call you back and put you on the radio. Needn't call, cost you more than a penny or two. You can also email via the website at talkradio.co.uk. You can text the word talk and then your message to 8722 but that'll cost you 25 pence plus normal sending charges perhaps best to tweet at George Galloway at Talk Radio but it's calls I'm interested in right now 0344 499 1000 Sue in Tregaron in Cardiganshire is first up, go ahead Sue Hello George Hi. Yes, uh, well I'm a as everybody says, long-time admirer of yours. Thank you, my dear. Um, right. Uh, before I go on to what I want to talk about is Brexit, but um, um, your previous caller was talking about um, the... Um, uh, or you announced that the Parliamentary Labour Party has announced that they are going to accept the international 
uh, interpretation. Yes, there's a motion it. being placed for Monday night. Yes, whatever state. And one, one presumes it will pass and thus cause a state of dual power to exist. Uh, there'll be a national executive, uh, there'll yes. be a leader of the Labour Party on one side, and there will be uh, however many they muster. I, ex- I, accept it, I expect yeah, yeah, it will be 100 the point plus I want to make is MPs. Is, there'll be the rest of the Labour members uh, come out and support Jeremy Corbyn. Well, how do they do that uh, before September is the question. They can't call a meeting of all 600,000 of them by Monday, uh, but the MPs can and have. They have? Oh, I haven't seen they've any. Called, they've called uh, this meeting uh, on Monday. They've tabled this motion, and my guess is that it will pass, and probably with a big majority, and thus the MPs will be no, no, effectively I'm declaring... About the support the, of Jeremy Corbyn. No, but... The, that, that she shouldn't have behaved in the way she did. No, but there's only about... 15 or 20 MPs support Jeremy Corbyn. The rest of them well, that don't. That is the problem, isn't yeah. it? It's and been the problem from the start. my point about Brexit, that you have got a lot of confidence that, well, I mean, so do I, that Corbyn and John MacDonald are uh, definitely on the right side of, uh, of Brexit. But the problem is that they won't have any support. No, if that's they right. were yeah. in power, right. uh, if this government had fallen, then the... Um, uh, you know, the Labour Party would have been in the same state, or Jeremy Corbyn would have been, would have been in the state in the same position as uh, Mays, because the Parliamentary Party would have refused to follow him or yes, that's uh, right. follow the follow the policy of Brexit. That's correct. Uh, that's what I was trying to say to Doogie, who was calling from Israel. Uh, that uh, that his issue is not with Jeremy Corbyn. His issue is with the people sitting behind him. Yes, and in addition to that, I don't know whether you realise that the majority of the Labour Party, the ordinary members, are also um, pr- remain. Well, nobody and knows that. To, nobody um, knows that, Sue. You know, different, uh, Sue, Sue, and different Sue, they, Sue, we keep getting told that, but nobody knows that. Nobody knows what the majority of Labour members well, think. Well, uh, I'm not talking about, I don't know how many thousands of the exact no. number, but when I go to Labour Party meetings or mm. anywhere, I mean, if I speak, you know, it, it, it just becomes impossible to carry on talking because they just really, really. become That's very, very upset. That's interesting. On Facebook or anything, if you mm. go, um, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Well, um, I'm um, sorry for that, but what I can tell you, and you should tell them, is that 70% just a shade under it, 69 point something, uh, of Labour-held constituencies in Parliament voted leave. Yes, uh, of course I do I do tell them, and I say that if you will keep on, on this policy, then you will, um, uh, you will lose election. There is no doubt about it. Definitely. Um, um, and the thing is... At least they, 5 million Labour voters voted Brexit. Precisely, but they, they don't follow that. They, it doesn't... It doesn't register with them. They just ignore it and carry on with that and all the abuses on the on the Brexiters. Now, they, in addition to that, uh, you see, they... Um, uh, they uh, well, anyway, what I think Jeremy Corbyn should do is he should go on tour of the whole country and talk about Brexit, talk about EU, so that... Um, ordinary members are will listen to him. They won't listen to me. Mm. What I say? Well, I, I think the <laughs> problem is that he's got uh, he's got rather a lot on his plate. Sue, it's a pleasure talking to you. But the switchboard is not only lighting up, but now full. So I need to uh, press ahead. Marie McFarlane on the Twitter says, "Thank God for George Galloway Talk Radio, which has just started. I seriously find the unblemished truth and solidarity between us all extremely." therapeutic. The rest of the mainstream media, she says, triggers mental ill health to the population. This is the antidote. I'm not kidding. Here. Thank you, Marie. Lizzie says, gorgeous George, I agree about James cleverly. I mentally tipped him as a future Tory leader just over a year ago. Nice pair of shoulders. Lovely boy. (laughs) I wouldn't go that far, but he is a a big, big, strong man with charisma and uh, a presence and a military record, and he's a Brexiteer, and I'm telling you, 
he's definitely the horse to back. Jimmy says, two legends on talk radio today, Mr. The James Well and now Moats with Mr. George Galloway. Two great presenters and always a great listen. So not a bad couple of days after St. Helens won away at Wigan last night in the biggest club rugby derby in the world. And Lubna says, listening to the teacher, George Galloway on talk radio, please join. Thanks, Lubna. And Name says, there are no robots here, George, just a lone male in a local authority property, breathing in unrelenting. Well, that's very poetic, but I don't know what it means. Mr R says, hi, George. James Cleverly appears to me as a political thug. I can't see any political, economic or social intelligence there. Uh, well, there's political intelligence. I don't know anything about his economic views. Uh, social intelligence, he has a presence. A political thug? Well, sometimes being a bit of a political thug is quite a useful uh, thing to be in politics. George, great show. Please talk about the idiocy and egotism of Elon Musk insulting that hero cave driver, cave diver, I beg your pardon, jazz in Brighton. I must say it was a foul, vile attack on our heroic diver. And Ray Spencer says, let's not forget that while the LFI are accusing Jeremy Corbyn of unfounded anti-Semitic racist slurs, Israel and its supporters are denying the historical existence of Palestine. Surely that's the highest form of racism you can get. And Chris says, I have tried, but I just cannot fathom why anyone with an ounce of sanity would be against improved relations with Russia. Quite so, Chris. Tom Smith says, I'm a Labour member since Jeremy Corbyn helped a new member with £25 to fight gerrymandering. Can Labour replace right-wing MPs before the next general election? I fear the tectonic plates have moved. Kate says, I love Doogie's accent. Kate, secretly, I love it too. Tony X says, that's the protest board, the hairs on my neck and arms are standing up, listening to George Galloway excoriating those who repeat the filthy, malicious lie that Corbyn is a racist and anti-Semite. Galloway, talk radio, what an introduction to the only radio show worth listening to. However, a, a gutless coward, anonymous texter, uh, probably the same one, as always, says the majority of people who voted Brexit did so because they don't want any more foreigners coming in. Try mixing with ordinary folk instead of going to posh dues. <laughs> and uh, the same man goes on. When's it going to sink into your thick, bald-headed skull? People voted Brexit because they hate foreigners coming into the country. I mix with these people. You don't. And Andy McGibbon says, Been on tour with the band, just home today, tired but settling down to listen to the only radio show worthy of the name Galloway on Talk Radio. Thanks, Andy. David Leviscont says, A wonderful solution to the Northern Ireland problem. Give Ireland back to Ireland. And if being British means so much, give them the opportunity to move to the UK. How very well put. And death to the Lanyard Mafia, <laughs> says, whatever you think about George Galloway, and he's all right with me, you can't say his radio show is no good. Thanks. And Jono says, spine-tingling opening, just loosened my collar. Thanks, Jono. And Matt says, the artful hodger strikes again with her wily schemes. After seeing the five-point lead Labour had just taken, she wasted no time to put her hands into Corbyn's pockets in an attempt to take it away from us. That's exactly the point. And on that, at least Professor Michael Rosen and I uh, were in agreement earlier. This has actually nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It's nothing to do with Jews or Judaism. Indeed, many of the leaders of this coup, for it is a coup, are not Jews, though they like to tell Jews what they should be thinking and saying. They like to decide who are the right Jews and who are the wrong ones. There, I think Mike's word was goisplaining all the time. Uh, but the reason for it is the five-point lead that Jeremy Corbyn and Labour had taken in the polls. The possibility of an early election, and therefore the real possibility, even probability, of Jeremy Corbyn being invited to form a government and enter 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister of Britain is just simply unpalatable. 
0344 That's the number to call. Now, Chris Williamson's the Labour MP for Derby North, former front bench spokesman on uh, fire safety matters, and now a redoubtable campaigner around the country with his Democracy Roadshow, uh, which I predict is going to make high summer for many, many uh, constituencies. And he joins me now. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, good evening, George. Now, uh, I was talking to Michael Rosen earlier, uh, and as I was, the news dropped uh, that uh, an emergency motion has been tabled at the Parliamentary Labour Party for Monday for the immediate uh, adoption into the standing orders of the PLP, the full IHRA definition on anti-Semitism and all of its examples, which is Mm. precisely what the National Executive Committee and the leader have said will not happen. Is this the parting of the ways, do you think? Well, I think the motion is out of order, I've got to say, George. The PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party, discussed this issue on Monday. Actually, I moved a point of order at the meeting to state that the National Executive Committee is the sovereign body of the Labour Party, and they've already come to a view about this matter, which actually is an enhanced variation on the IHRA's definition. And many people... You know, scholars and and, and, uh, eminent members of the Jewish community, uh, you know, acknowledge that. And, you know, the examples, we've accepted the full definition. Let's be clear about this. And the sort of working examples that the IHRA put forward uh, were there. And they weren't, I don't believe, even by the IHRA, set in tablets of stone. It's kind of a working document which can be enhanced, nuanced and improved upon. And I think the National Executive Committee have poured over this matter for a long time. They've taken sound and spoken to people in the Jewish community, contrary to assertions that they had not. Uh, several members of the National Executive Committee are themselves, as you know, George, Jewish. And, you know, they've come to, I think, a very clear and firm view about this matter. And so to uh, you know, have another motion under the pretext that this is an emergency for the Parliamentary Labour Party on the, on the day before the penultimate day of uh, uh, Parliament sitting on a one-line whip when I think many Labour MPs you know, will be in their constituencies rather than in Parliament, I think is, is, is not the right way to proceed. And in fact, I'm in the process actually of, of actually writing a, a note to that effect to the chair of the PLP, because uh, I just don't think this is helpful. I think we should be coming together and just to, to take the heat well, out look, of it. Well, uh, helpful. Look at what uh, the NEC has yeah. actually put forward. Well, helpful, of course it isn't, uh, but uh, a motion uh, can be accepted by the chair. Those who think mm. it's out of order can challenge the chair's ruling, and then a simple majority will decide if the chairman's mm. ruling uh, prevails. And I'm going to predict to you, partly for the reasons you've just given, that it will be sparsely attended, uh, Mm. that the chair will rule it to be in order and he will be challenged, uh, for he is a he, uh, and uh, uh, that challenge will be overruled and that the PLP will vote to adopt this motion into its standing orders. And if I'm right in those predictions, a state of dual power will then exist in the Labour Party. Yeah, but I mean, the point is, George, that it can't because the Parliamentary Labour Party is just as subject to the oversight of the National Executive Committee as the next Labour Party member is. And it's at that point at the PLP uh, on Monday. And, uh, you know, I stand by that view. I mean, the rule book is very clear on this. I think it's uh, Chapter 1, Clause 8, Paragraph 3. And I think there are various other references throughout the Labour Party rule book that makes very clear who the sovereign body is, and it is not the Parliamentary Labour Party. I mean, the Parliamentary Labour Party, yes, and I've made this point on a number of occasions, is an important element of the Labour Party, but let's be clear, it is a tiny proportion of the overall membership of the Labour Party. The Parliamentary Labour Party is not the Labour Party. It's, uh, you know, 260-odd members. It represents less than 0.04% of the total membership of the Labour Party, and it's a diminishing proportion as well because the membership is growing. And I think, frankly, George, it would be growing quicker were it not for some of these uh, manufactured um, disputes and arguments which are regrettably being caused by a tiny 
proportion of uh, what I've described as continuity new labour, and uh, it's very unfortunate, and uh, that's one of the reasons, you know, I'd like to see you know, members more subject to uh, the, uh, the sort of oversight of their their members, the scrutiny of their members in their constituencies. I think the changes that were brought about by Neil Kinnock, the trigger ballot mechanism, without wanting to get too technical about Labour Party rules, it makes it very difficult for uh, ordinary members in the constituency to have an open contest before each general election. Whereas what I'm calling for, and I'm hopeful that the conference this year, and if it does not this year, I think it will come because there's massive support amongst the membership, to have oversight of who their candidates are going into each election. And I think if we get to that position, as we had in the early 1980s, then I think MPs, Labour MPs, would take more account of what their members are saying in their local constituencies. And I've got to tell you, as I go around the country and I go around, you know, speak to constituencies two, sometimes three times a week and all over the country, there is overwhelming support for uh, a more open contest to select candidates and huge frustration and anger at the handful of individuals who are creating, uh, you know, difficulties for the Labour Party and they are using their friends in the media and that's, you know, it's just not right. I mean, you know, look, the enemies are the Tories and we should be pulling together. This is the worst government. It's even worse than Margaret Thatcher's when you look at the, the poverty that they've inflicted on people, the chaos, the precarious work uh, that people are forced into these days, the housing crisis, the people sleeping on the streets, etc. Huge problems. And we need to pull together in order to address this and, 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 and you know, put forward a coherent programme at the next election. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons, as I say, George, why I'm going around and speaking to members and encouraging them to, you know, take ownership of the party is that, you know, if people are not prepared to do that, well, then members need to have, in my opinion, the opportunity to to select people who will. Well, I think it's the very prospect of that, that uh, and Michael Rosen and I both believe this is the beginning of a coup, the last coup, a coup mm. to break up the Labour Party by, you say a handful, I say rather more, uh, members of the Parliamentary Labour Party. But time will tell on that. Well, well when I say a handful, George, I'm on about a handful of, of, um, of, of, of people in the, in the Labour Party. I mean, there's, there's perhaps slightly more than a handful, but, it, but it's not huge numbers in the Parliamentary Labour Party. I, would, you know, the, I wouldn't say it's anywhere near the majority. I mean, no, no I, I think it's the best part of 100. I'm not sure it's that many, but, you know, we could argue about We could, that, we could. Yeah, Let me ask yeah. you a, a, a bigger question then. Why is it treated, and I was a part of the campaign for mandatory reselection, in the mm. late 1970s, early 80s, which prevailed but didn't last for very long. Why is it regarded mm. as a kind of Bolshevism to have in every parliamentary cycle uh, a new contest as to who should carry the, the party's banner into the next election? After all, in both of the American parties, Democrats and Republicans, this is the norm. This happens every time there's an election. You've got to win a primary mm before you can be the candidate of the Democrats or the Republicans? Well, absolutely. I mean, and, and maybe it's because, as Tony Benn once said, that democracy is the most revolutionary thing in the world. And, you know, I think some of these people feel that, you know, a democratic revolution is gripping the Labour Party at the moment and their power base is, is threatened. But listen, in my opinion, George, nobody has anything to fear. No hardworking MP who treats their members with respect, who, who does a good job as a constituency member, who, who raises issues in the House and, you know, is outspoken. And I don't think people expect, members expect their MPs to be automatons and to just be, you know, at their, at their beck and call on, on every issue in that sense. Um, but I think, and we know this from history, relatively recent history, that when we had mandatory reselection, very few MPs were deselected, in fact, but what it did do, I think, is it sort of concentrated minds and it, and it actually engendered, I think, an appropriate sort of relationship between the Member of Parliament and the members on the ground, the grassroots members on the ground. The danger is now, well, it's not just the danger, it's, it's a fact, I, I regret to say, with, with, with some people, that they are trapped in this Westminster bubble. This sense of entitlement has uh, taken over there persona and uh, you know they feel that they are uh, above scrutiny and that can't be right in a democracy it seems to me and that's all i'm saying is look you know give members a say and it makes for better politics in my view as well because 
let's remember, we are now a mass party and it's growing all the time. And if we could be a bit more united in the Parliamentary Labour Party, it would grow even more quickly. But because we are a mass party now, that means that our members, the grassroots members, they are the eyes the, and the ears of the Labour movement, of the Labour Party. And the MPs inevitably can't be on the ground in their constituency every day of the week because they're down in Westminster and so on. And so having that kind of relationship with, with members, respecting them and giving them that opportunity to you know, have that dialogue with their member, it would help members to be better representatives. And I think it was Ed Miliband, you know, who also said, um, a, a while ago, when I think he was uh, standing as the leader, that if the Labour Party had listened to its members a bit more when we were last in government under the new Labour regime, then we wouldn't have made the mis- as many of the mistakes as we did. We wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq. We wouldn't have supported private, the private finance initiative. We wouldn't have made the cuts in Social Security benefit. We wouldn't have imposed tuition fees. We wouldn't have brought private health care into the NHS and, and you know, a number of other errors that we made, errors of judgment that we made. And I think now we're in an even stronger position in terms of the membership to have a, you know, as it were, a finger on the pulse, as it were, because there are so many more members of the Labour Party who are ordinary members of the community. And so surely it's the right thing to do, isn't it, to listen to our members in each constituency and to learn from them and to feel strengthened and emboldened by that. And I tell you what, if we had... Uh, a sort of open selections, open primaries, mandatory selection, whatever you want to call it, George, it would make better representatives, stronger representatives, because if you had that endorsement each time from your members going into the election, that would be a huge fillet, wouldn't it? Indeed. To, Look, tell you know, me about, your, your, just your finally, standard. finally, Chris, tell me about your Democracy Roadshow. Where has it been? Where is it going? How do people jump on board? Right. Well, we've only just started. We've had one session already in Durham uh, last week. It was uh, on the Thursday, that is, uh, hugely uh, uh, oversubscribed and um, massive support, I've got to say, for the sort of things that we're talking about. We're not only talking about how we select our uh, candidates for the uh, each general election, although that is a prominent part of it, something I feel very passionate about, but we're talking about the entirety of the democracy review, how we make policy, uh, how we elect our leader, you know, getting rid of the, uh, the, uh, the present system that we have for, uh, you know, the policy forums for making uh, policy, uh, how we elect our council leaders and various other elements that are contained within the Labour Party's democracy review, which will be, you know, a thoroughly good thing when we hopefully agree uh, the recommendations at the Labour Party uh, conference. Uh, but we've been inundated with requests. Um, uh, Tosh MacDonald is uh, the ASLEF president. He's working very closely with me on that. And we've got a range of other speakers who will be coming to the different sessions uh, around the, the country. When Tosh was at the main event at the Durham Miners Gala on uh, Saturday last, he was saying that he couldn't walk more than a few steps without somebody inviting him to come to their constituency. So we're going to basically every constituency, uh, not every constituency, I beg your pardon, all regions of the country will we will be uh, visiting. As I say, we've been to Durham um, already. We're going to Redcar relatively soon, uh, planning to go to a, a range of constituencies in, in Oilford and, and, and uh, Bermondsey and places like that in, in London. Some in the Midlands, you know, uh, in the Northwest, in a couple in Liverpool, etc. So, yeah, we're looking to try and cover all bases. And uh, we've also had um, uh, we've had uh, people contact us to say that, you know, from Momentum to say that you know any that I physically can't manage to get to because of the sheer quantity that they will that they will help. So we'll, it looks like we'll have a democracy uh, democracy roadshow uh, mark two, as it were, that will be hitting the road pretty soon as well. And how do people uh, uh, get the details? Follow you on Twitter, Chris Williamson MP? Follow, uh, absolutely. They can, they, they, so at, at Darby Chris W on, on Twitter. But if they if they Google uh, the Democracy Roadshow, that we, we've got a, a website up and people can contact us uh, through that or they can come just contact me via my uh, email address. If they can, again, they can Google me on that. It's just chris.williamson.mp at parliament.uk. So any of those routes, you know, either Facebook, I've got a Facebook page, Chris Williamson MP, not my private one. I mean, they can contact me, Bernard, as well, but it's better if they contact us through the, the, the MP page that I have. So Chris Williamson MP on, face, on Facebook, uh, Darby Chris W, or should I say, at Darby Chris W on Twitter, uh, email chris.williamson.mp 
at uh, mp at parliament.uk I suspect or, 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 or Google the uh, or Google yeah, is, uh, Democracy, Democracy Roadshow. Roadshow and you'll find it on I, the website. I, I expect people are doing that right now. Chris Williamson, Labour MP for Derby North. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. 0344 499 1000. That's the number to call. Or you can text as Scally from West London has. Evening, George. Love your show. I've only just tuned in. I'm getting married tomorrow and listening to you the night before. Well, that takes the biscuit. I'll tell you what, Scally, you'll definitely be much more likely to get to the church on time if you stay in and listen to me the night before your wedding. And the very, very best to both of you. May you have a long, lifelong and happy marriage and many children. I know that's old-fashioned, but that's how I look on things. The communicipalist says, in my view of the left-right divide in British politics, by definition, anti-Semites cannot be on the left. Anti-Jewish racism puts them on the right, whatever badges they wear. The anti-Semite slur against Jeremy Corbyn is, in my view, anti-Semitic itself. And Chaz in Chiswick uh, says, uh, Viva George and Robin. That's Robin Finlay. Uh, it's uh, just not anti-Jew to criticise ethnic cleansing, settlement, expansion and invasion. Labour and all reasonable people should be clearer. And he adds, P.S. Replace pairing with the proxy vote. P.P.S. What about Matthew Wright for a talk radio show? Intelligent, passionate, engaging. Indeed he is. And uh, I don't know what he's going to do now that he's left the right stuff, uh, but whatever he does... He'll have my support for sure. Let's talk to the legend that is Nigel in Temple Fortune. Nigel, welcome. George, good evening and welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. I hope you're well. Yes, uh, very well. Anti Anti-Semitism, Brexit. And if I can just make a quick remark about your uh, your special guest, uh, Michael Rosen. Yes. So I think he made a slight error. He, uh, he doesn't make many. Sort of, well, maybe if I'm wrong, then I'm, I'm, I'll exactly retract it. He talks about the Tory party having money pumped into it like the Trump uh, parties in America. But, of course, uh, in, 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 in America, I think you'll agree with me, it's unregulated how much money can go into a party. We're here, it's different. Uh, no, the money that can be spent is regulated, but not the money that goes in. No, you could give unlimited money in, uh, but you can only spend a limited amount. But the limit is so vast that you'd be very lucky indeed if you were able to spend to it, Nigel. Yeah, so there's a slight difference. Okay, uh, in relation to Brexit, I, I I voted to come out. I think Theresa May is blinkered with one uh, with one leg uh, tied to the other. I don't think she's going to she's going to be able to uh, deliver it. I don't think her heart's in it. No. And when people talk about how terrible it's going to be, well, of course, I remember before we were in the European uh, the EEC as it was in those days, mm -hmm. and we managed, we survived, we we, we continued to trade, and let's not forget. Actually, that. we did really well. Uh, Britain yeah. uh, between 1964 and 1973 uh, was the uh, best period uh, in British history, in my view. Britain was yeah. a beacon uh, to the world. All roads led to London, swinging London, and all of that. Exactly, and I think that. Uh, as an example, in 2016, I think it was, BMW as a motor group sold just shy of 250,000 cars in this country. I don't think any motor manufacturer is going to be bullied by Europe into not selling cars here. No, definitely uh, not. So I, I think that we have a, an exciting time ahead. We have a chance to excel, a chance to make our mark on the world, and a chance to do better. But I think that Theresa May not going to deliver it. No, and she and they have completely failed to uh, to inspire the country with a vision of the Britain that can be. Nigel, thanks for that call. Let's go to Gary in Maidenhead. Go ahead, Gary. Good, good afternoon or good evening, George. Good evening How to you? you. George, um, I'm what, possibly one of your greatest fans. I really am. I hear a butt coming here, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right. I really am, and I think uh, you're a great man. You've done your oratory is beyond belief. Thank you, my but friend. But great people sometimes make big mistakes. All right? And I believe that Brexit is a major, major error for a whole range of reasons, okay? Mm -hmm. We talk about sovereignty and sovereign states. When I think of that, I think immediately of Germany under Hitler. I think of uh, Italy under, under Mussolini. I think of Spain under Franco. 
okay? And we didn't have too good a history, okay, in the days of <coughs> the British Empire. No, okay? we had a very bad history. Absolutely, all right? And there's a lot to be proud of. I live in Britain. I came from South Africa. I love the country. And I would, if I was a younger man and Britain was attacked, I'd go to war on behalf of Britain. Mm -hmm. But invading foreign countries, okay, on the pretext of lies that are being perpetrated, to me, that's nothing to be proud of. No, right? quite, quite so. Now, now let, can I just finish, okay, that Europe has had a restraining effect. There was a time when U European countries were killing each other in constant wars, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And... <clears throat> I don't recall, and I could be wrong on this, but I don't recall Europe now as a combined uh, entity, okay, invading countries or declaring war on countries. You must have missed Yugoslavia then and Libya. I probably... Uh, hang on, Libya, okay, that was primarily engineered by the Americans and... No, and that's, that's just not so, Gary. Uh, the attack on Libya was engineered by David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy. Barack yeah. Obama was bounced into that war. Terrible mistake, like the, the invasion of Iraq. Mm. Yeah. In opinion, any case, uh, in any case, Gary, uh, even by your own standards, Britain's not leaving NATO. It's the European Union doesn't have a, a military force. Yeah, uh, they're I, they're they're all in NATO, and yeah. Britain will continue. I'm sorry to say, to yeah, be but, in NATO. But but George, there's an example of we don't have the 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 independence that we'd like to think we have. NATO is a force that we are part of. Yes. For okay. now, yeah. For so, now, yeah. You know, so much for sovereignty. I think that we could sacrifice a little, a little bit of sovereignty. Okay. In I'm happy to do that, uh, Gary. I think uh, you're making a straw man. If if uh, the European peoples decided to come together in a democratic union, yep. uh, I'd be all in favour of that. I'm against the European Union because it's an undemocratic union that is built on a total lack of consent from the people. Uh, in it. The countries uh, that would uh, love to have a referendum like we did will never be given one because you could be sure what the result would be. People hate the European Union on the continent. Well, if that's the case, George, don't you think that they in time would change that? No, well, every the, country... well, it's been 45 years uh, we've been in it, Gary, and it hasn't changed one jot. Well, in fact, the only change that... has been in the opposite direction. It's yeah, got less think... and less democratic. More and more uh, you know, neoliberal. I think, I think democracy is a kind of a fig leaf. It's overstated. The, the real power is not in the electorate. Okay? I think that if we had uh, to vote again, and I don't believe in a second referendum, not for one minute. There won't what be I, one, no. What I do believe is that we should hand over the power to the people that we voted in. The politicians voted overwhelmingly to, to remain. Even to, Theresa May was a remainer. OK, I don't go to my doctor and tell him what's wrong with me. Well, that, look, that's true it. that they did, Gary. But Sorry? the people but the people voted overwhelmingly the other way. No, Both I parties the people were, were hoodwinked into that. vote. Well, you can't but you can't second guess election results like that. But, Otherwise, we could second guess every but, poll no, I in that, that way. George, but no, but no, no, here's my why. point. I think you didn't grasp it. Both parties ran in 2017 on general election manifestos accepting the Brexit referendum result. And more than 80% of the people voted for those two parties. So the people have already spoken. There's already been a people's vote. And we can't well, leave it I to MPs to I, betray I, I, I the people's how many vote. Of those people knew a damn thing well, about the Irish border. Gary, okay. I've been saying all my life, how could people possibly elect a Tory government? But it doesn't change <laughs> the fact that they did. I need to go. Gary, a pleasure as always uh, talking to you. Stuart. Uh, on the email says, Good evening, George. Why do you think the liberal political and media establishment, both in the UK and the USA, are hell-bent on wrecking good relations between Trump and Putin's governments? Do these liberals want all-out conflict and nuclear war between America and Russia? What do you think? Stuart, the best thing that Donald Trump ever said, and it was so good, he couldn't possibly have written it. He said, I'm prepared to take political risks for peace but I'm not prepared to risk war for politics. Pretty good from a big plank of wood like him. The Communicipalist says it's been clear for the past 30 years or more that Europe is a divisive issue in the Conservative Party. David Cameron's arrogant gamble to resolve that schism resulted in a grassroots mutiny against austerity 
and the political establishment to blame. Absolutely correct. The vote in the referendum wasn't just about immigration, as the gutless coward keeps texting over and over again. He hates me so much, he listens to every show and spends 25 pence plus sending charges, sending dozens of texts. Does your wife know, gutless coward? Does Mrs. Gutless Coward know how you spend your Friday evenings? But the point is, it wasn't just about immigration. Though of course it was in part about immigration. It was a revolt from the streets against austerity, against the way things are, and against the people perceived as having put us in the state we are in. It was a, the more they brought out Tony Blair, John Major, Nick Clegg, David Cameron, Peter Mandels, the more they brought these people out, I could touch, see, smell the votes for the European Union going down the drain. Chris says, for all our sakes, Trump needs to stop letting the liberal warmongers get to him and stick to his guns regarding Russia. Lizzie says, George, I read today that Jeremy Corbyn, with AIDS, are sure of an election within the year, that plans are being drawn up to enable Labour to enter number 10. How true is this? asks Lizzie. Well, the Fixed Term Parliament Act makes forcing a general election very difficult. You can't force one because you need to get a very big majority of members of Parliament to vote for one, uh, two-thirds. That won't happen. So it can only happen if both parties decide that the situation is so broken that the country demands and requires it. And that's what I hope will happen. But if it doesn't, here's what happens. A motion of no confidence in this government passes and that government falls. But the parliament doesn't fall. The same parliament chooses a new government. And how that works is that the Queen sends for the person in this parliament that she believes has the ability to command a majority in the House. Now, that person that she chooses may not be able to command a majority in the House. For example, if she chose Jeremy Corbyn, as she most likely would, and Jeremy Corbyn went to the palace, he'd have to show her that he had a majority to form a government. And I don't believe that he could, because a sufficiently large number of Labour traitors would not support a Queen's speech that Jeremy Corbyn could put his name to. So somebody else would get chosen, somebody else in the Conservative Party or somebody else in the middle, somebody who defected from the Labour Party, somebody who defected from the Conservative Party. And they may not be able to form a government either, in which case we'd go on and on and on, like Italy used to be, having governments that didn't survive the day or the week or the month until eventually everybody realised we can't go on like this. We'll have to have a new general election. Switchboard lit up. Indeed, it's been full all night. Here's Regan from Newcastle upon time. Go on ahead, hello. Regan. Oh, hello, George. You OK? Yeah, good, sir. Nice to speak to you. Um, and you? Yeah, it's... Um... I'll try and be as brief as I can. It, it's relating to the Margaret Hodge kind of thing. Oh, yes. um, yeah. Um, allow me to just... Basically, I um, maybe about 10 years ago used to read The Sun and then uh, vote for the Lib Dems in 2010. Didn't turn out too well. Um, I got enthused by Ed Miliband. I thought he was very good. Didn't go far enough. Um, but, you know, I liked him. I was very disappointed when they lost that election. Um, and got very enthused by Corbyn. And um, uh, the way that I've seen it since then, um, I, I find it very instructive to listen to you because a lot of people that you talk to say, oh, you know, anti-Semitism, it, it's a stick to beat Corbyn with. And, and I do believe that is true in this case, but it's nice to listen to you historically sort of say that anti-Semitism is a, a vicious crime and remains so. 
Um, and I, I just get the feeling that the likes of Margaret Hodge saying, you know, going up to someone calling him an effing anti-Semite, they are debasing the term to such a level that it is going to be very, very dangerous. It and, is it's uh, dangerous I... for everyone, for all of us, because on the principle of the boy who cried wolf, uh, when real anti-Semitism comes along uh, and people call it out, uh, then they're less likely to be believed because the currency has been debased, devalued, even bankrupted. And I gave an example earlier of what's just been decided in Austria, where people uh, who want to go to a kosher butcher will have to register, imagine, uh, all on the spurious grounds of animal rights. And that will affect uh, halal meat, of course, which is basically the same thing. And thereby you get a register of Jews and a register of Muslims in Austria. What could possibly go wrong, Regan? Yeah, and we see the way this goes historically. And uh, having listened to yourself for, for some time now, well, and other people as well, um, it, as I say, it's very instructive to, to learn about this. I think a lot of people like myself who have come to the left fairly recently yeah. don't really appreciate the horrors of anti-Semitism. Well, the, you but see, that's... Corbyn definitely does. Uh, what I have been saying uh, for many, many, many years is exactly what Corbyn has been saying. We are yeah. against what Israel does. We are in favor of Palestinian rights and we stand like a block against racism in any and all forms, including anti-Semitism. And Margaret Hodge knows that very well. As Michael Rosen said, she's known Jeremy Corbyn even longer than I have known him. He was a councillor with her. He was in local government in North London. Indeed, he came to her defence at a very, very rocky time for her in the period of extreme naivety that Michael Rosen uh, referred to earlier. This was a staged provocation. It has nothing to do with a genuine belief on Margaret Hodge's part that Jeremy Corbyn is an effing anti-Semite and a racist. That's just beneath contempt. Regan, thanks for the call. Christina says, it feels like a nightmare sometimes. I can't believe that the Tory government is comprised of so many disreputable people. They lie, they cheat, they deceive the British public. They bring shame on the UK Parliament and democracy. And yet, they keep their jobs. Marie says, we're so lucky to have you uh, on talk radio. You're the greatest political orator of the 21st century, as well as being a father and a grandfather. I would say your oratorios are befitting of a combined Vladimir Lenin and Keir Hardy. We need to hear righteous anger. Thank you, Marie. Let's hear a voice that we always need to hear. The legend, Norma, in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Hi. Um, I'd just like to put my little two pennies in. Yeah. Now, this is what I'm asking you. Am I right in thinking that Gerald Kaufman, the MP for Court in Manchester, died this week? Oh, no, he died uh, more than a year ago. Oh, my husband said he thought that. Well, anyway... He died more than a year ago, but it's good that you brought him up because yeah. uh, if I were Jeremy Corbyn, I would only use three words to answer these people. I would say the three words, Sir Gerald Kaufman. Yeah. We stand for exactly the same thing as Sir Gerald Kaufman, whose grandmother didn't die in her bed at the hands of the Nazi invaders to give cover to people murdering Palestinian grandmothers in their beds this evening, right now. It's happening right now. There's a massive bombardment of Gaza right now. Other people's grandmothers are dying in their beds. And as Sir Gerald said, I'm not going to allow my grandmother to be used as a cover for that. Well, yes, I mean, that's awful what you're just saying. But I'm, he was somebody I really admired because he had guts and he saw the situation there closely. Very clearly, and, yeah. Uh, he was a dear know, friend of mine. He defended mine. the Palestinian rights and he was a Jewish MP. He was a dear know? friend of mine. And when he died, uh, he was denounced 
by the same people denouncing Jeremy Corbyn now uh, because they said he was a self-hating Jew. Now, everybody who knew Gerald knew, first of all, that he certainly didn't hate himself in any regard. He held himself in very high regard. And the very last thing he could possibly have hated was I mean, the great, fact I had great that he was Jewish. For him. He was yeah. a beautiful person. Yeah. God rest his soul. Thanks for that, Norma. Let's hear from Ricardo in Glasgow. Good to be talking to you again, George. And you, sir, go ahead. Well, it's about this, uh, what's happening in Labour at the moment. Yes, a bit of a mess, isn't it? It's a mess, but it's a diminishing mess every time they start this. I hope so. You'll remember, well, you rem- you'll, you'll remember every time. Every, every time Labour are ahead in the polls or neck and neck with the Tories, what happens? People... Uh, and the centre, the Blairites, the media, all come out and make as much noise as possible about Jeremy Corbyn. And implicitly, they make this noise about us, the Labour Party membership. Yeah, of course it is, uh, by extension, an attack on you. Uh, the uh, prediction last Friday uh, on social media, when Labour went five points ahead, was that the weekend's papers would bring another anti-Semitism scandal. And just like clockwork, that's exactly what happened. And it's debasing all the issues that are being raised uh, in this bogus campaign against Corbyn. It's bad for Labour. It's bad for Britain. It's bad for Jewish people. It's bad for the cause of anti-fascism and defence of minorities. It's bad all round. It is utterly reckless, utterly careless of the real needs of minority communities in Britain and their need to be defended uh, by all of us. But it was all entirely predictable, Ricardo. But thankfully, thankfully though, George, the more and more noise they make, the fewer and fewer people give a damn because there's no longer rule over our eyes, and more and more, and more people are realising. Still, they live in a they live in an introspective bubble. They do live in a bubble. Yeah, uh, it's a much bigger issue in the bubble than it is uh, on the streets. That's exactly, and I'm for sure. And I and I read this this week. John Woodcock MP and someone called Jane Merrick, who I'd, I'd never heard of her before, they resigned from the Labour Party, and this establishment. Expect everyone to go. Oh, where do we go from here? When the fact is, no one actually cares. No one's ever heard of these people. And yeah. Margaret Hodges, are another one. No one has cared about what she had to say for about ten years. They're not relevant anymore. Very well put, Ricardo. Very powerfully put. Thanks very much indeed for that call. Mark in Lowestoft says, "Isn't it obvious by now that the peasants on both sides of the Atlantic voted the wrong way, Brexit and Trump?" as the deep state goes into overdrive to ruin and overturn a democratic vote, thus exposing the shamocracy that we are all really in. Thanks for the weekly Mind Detox, George. All the best. Thank you, uh, Mark, uh, indeed. Let me go to the next one, because I've got literally scores of them. Bob Justice says, Well, it's been an intense, unrelenting week of propaganda. It's beyond tedious. Anti-Semitism has been devalued. Israel has legislated for apartheid. Blairites prove party politics a farce. Presumably MH17 is now the go-to tragedy. Meanwhile, in Yemen... Dot, dot, dot. Thank you, Bob. Scouser Lahr. I hope uh, you've got your tickets for my Liverpool gig, my dear friend Scouser Lahr, in uh, 8 September uh, in uh, St George's Hall. John Woodcock resigned from the Labour Party this week. Rejoice! Let's hope all the other red Tories are soon driven out. The revolution will not be televised, says. Surely the solution to Brexit is the so-called hard Brexit, offering tariff-free trade where appropriate. Well, that's what I called for on the very first day. The very first day, two years ago. Send them an email. We're out of here. We'll not put any tariffs on any of your goods and services. And we trust you won't do that for us either. We will allow your people to visit Britain anytime they like 
as we presume you will allow ours. Any of your people currently established here in our country are welcome to stay. Presumably, you will reciprocate. We'll keep to at least your standards on food, on hygiene, on agriculture, on the environment. And we trust that you might well want to catch up with us when you see the kind of standards we impose. Bye. It's been nice knowing you. That's what we could have done. That's what we should have done. The communicipalist says, I think the rose-tinted view of the EU that says Brexit won't work, we may have to go back cap in hand to a deeply unstable EU, is a bit defeatist myself, who is embracing a world working together to resolve humanity's problems. That's my Brexit. Mine too. And Pete, liberal Pete, says, George, I'm getting very upset about this traitoress to the American people. President Trump for sucking up to and bowing down to dictators like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un. This would not have happened if the Democrats was in power, and the sooner they rid of Trump, the better, for world peace and stability. That's from mad, sorry, liberal Pete in Islington. And John Hodgkins says, real anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe must be confronted. Some incidents in the Ukraine recently have been particularly shocking. It is beyond reason that the foul-mouthed dame Margaret Hodge doesn't seem to be bothered about that. Her false accusations against Jeremy Corbyn must not be allowed to stand. She should be ashamed of herself. Cheers, John Hodgkins. Now, Flippin' Kath is flying solo tonight after this, I think, at 10 o'clock. She's a truly tremendous presenter. Ian Lee's poorly. She is flying the plane herself, and I predict she'll make a very big success of it. So stay tuned after me, won't you? Here's Pat in Stepney. Go ahead, Pat. Oh, good evening, George. Evening. Yeah, I mean, I was phoning in about, like, Putin and um, Trump. Yeah. And I think that he, you know, did did good about like getting him over to America in the autumn, mm-hmm. and to talk about whatever they're going to talk about. Um, I think that, oh yeah, whatever he has done or he might have not have done, but it's all speculation. Um, I think that the West needs to have dialogue with. Putin. Yeah, I mean, what kind of person uh, opposes that point of view? I, I really don't understand. And what kind of liberal, what kind of leftist, what kind of progressive is against the leaders of the two countries that hold 90 plus percent of all the nuclear weapons in the world actually getting along with each other? Why Why wouldn't you want that? Well, you, you, you would want that, wouldn't you? You would, you would want, like, you know, a, a good dialogue. Yeah, that's what we used to campaign for. And and the the, the the thing is that how can these people call themselves liberals when they're hell bent on like holding their nose up and sneering at Putin? I mean, I, I, fair enough. He he might be a little bit of a wide boy and have shenanigans, you know, at his feet. I, uh, I, unlike I, our leaders. I, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, nobody comes out of this with with a halo on their on their heads, but I, I, I mean, I've got a um, you know, I mean, um, parts of the establishment in America, I feel, have been wetting their trousers for decades to have a straight up shooting war with Russia. But well, so, some of them have, yeah. But for the the liberals, it's it's a look over their strategy. They cannot accept that the only reason that Donald Trump is the president is that they chose Hillary Clinton to be their candidate. That she was the only person in America who could have lost to Donald Trump. But they can't accept that, not least because they rigged, hacked, rigged the selection process so that Bernie Sanders, who would have beaten Donald Trump comfortably, couldn't be their candidate because they were determined it would be Hillary Clinton. And that's why they lost. So they can't accept that. So they've got to say, look, over there, that's the reason. It's the Russians. Snow on their boots. That's what's going on, Pat. I mean, 
getting back to the presidential, yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, was it the fact that the liberal, well, I, call, I don't call them liberals, but the establishment in America, because they had a black president before, that they wanted a woman president. I mean, I'm not being racist or feminist or anything. Is it, was it just sort of like they wanted something of, the, uh, like a different sort of person, you know, what was it no, all sort of like, you they, know, they knew, that, uh, they knew that Hillary Clinton was a safe pair of hands for the hidden state, the deep state. She'd follow the orthodoxies of war, constant rearmament, constant interference around the world to maintain American hegemony. That's why they wanted her. Mm. And they couldn't be sure that Trump would be controllable in all those regards. And they were right about that, because nobody can control Trump. Nobody knows what he's going to say or do next. No, that that's true. But as I say, he, he has made a move to engage Putin. I mean, yeah. at Helsinki, and uh, he's invited him over to the White House. Yeah. And, well... <laughs> he, Sounds he's like not, a good plan to me. He's not doing anything wrong in that respect. I well, mean, look, uh, Ronald Reagan went for a walk in the woods with Mikhail Gorbachev when he was the Soviet leader. What and saved he saved the world thereby from a race to nuclear Armageddon. What do they call it? Perestroika? Uh, per, he called it perestroika uh, when he came to power. It was a restructuring, that's what that means, a restructuring of Soviet power. Uh, in the end, it destroyed Soviet power. But Ronald Reagan, who was a right-wing Republican, uh, went for a walk in the woods, just him and Gorby. And they came up with the START Treaty, which severely limited, savagely reduced, actually, the number of nuclear warheads in the world. And Eisenhower uh, met Khrushchev and bear-hugged him. Uh, the, uh, Richard Nixon, the ultra-hawk, uh, met uh, uh, Richard Nixon, met uh, Brezhnev in uh, 1969. Uh, it, it used to be something to celebrate when the Russians and the Americans talked Turkey. I mean, you know, they could, I mean, if if we could get good relations between America, the West, and Russia, I mean, there's lots of good that can come out of it. I mean, it, it, you know... That well, we, uh, to paraphrase, look, to paraphrase Trump, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Pat in Stepney, thanks for the call. The Red Resistance says, please tell me, George, why is it Margaret Hodge is often labelled as a Holocaust survivor when, in fact, she was born in Cairo in 1944 with her family having been resident there for business purposes, having been resident there for business purposes since the early 1930s? Well, she had close relatives uh, who were slaughtered along with six million other Jews in the Holocaust. Uh, so she's perfectly entitled to be so described. But as Michael Rosen, who also has exactly the same background, pointed out earlier, you only get called that if you hate Corbyn, not if you like him. And Lars Fenson says the general election was not needless from a Tory point of view. The government was at the time most likely afraid of what the aftermath of the Tory election fraud investigation would be. And Tad says, George, I will beat the Remain argument every day of the week, and I'm sure you would too. But it's like talking to the Flat Earth Society and trying to convince them that the world is really spherical. Remainers think of us leavers as heretics, but the church made that mistake with Nicholas Copernicus, yet now his is the prevailing orthodoxy. So how do we change the minds of the intransigent Remainers? Or are we really talking about vested interests, as in the case of a certain very rich man who isn't against trying to bankrupt a country to suit himself? Indeed, Ted. Well, dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. Uh, we will leave the European Union in March, one way or another. It'd be better if it were done in a tidier way than it currently is. Chris M. says, excellent point from Michael Rosen. Yes, how Margaret Hodge has known Jeremy Corbyn for 40 years and has never said he was an anti-Semite. It's purely a political act. She would have easily liked he said voiced in private or through proper channels.
It is, it is the mother of all talk shows, and I'm back on Monday morning at 10 a.m. So if you can, listen in then too. Chris uh, says, no, I've done that one. Let me go to Sean in Waterloo. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, good evening, George. Evening, sir. Um, yes, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, share a, a few observations with you um, about, uh, about uh, well, the crescendo of Rus- Russophobic hysteria that we've seen uh, this week. Mm. Um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about Russia anyway, but, uh, I mean, this week it's really been sh- thrown into relief. And I... Uh, I don't think I've known a week think, like it, Sean, really. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's been extraordinary, despite the fact that we've had four years of extraordinary relations between the West and Russia since um, the Ukrainian debacle. But I, I, I something crystallised for me uh, this week that it it seems to me that there are kind of two vicious spirals feeding off of each other uh, now. And on the one hand, in the U.S., you've got this McCarthyite frenzy of the U.S. establishment over Trump finally talking to Putin at the summit, which he he said he was going to do during uh, his his campaign. And in response to that, you've got uh, former CIA boss uh, John Brennan, um, actually accusing him of quote unquote treason, yeah. uh, and then you've got uh, little brother in the UK uh, with this uh, report that the British police have identified uh, the Russian Russian suspect for uh, Novichok one. And uh, what I found extraordinary about the, the latter case was that um, Channel Four, uh, when they reported it, admitted that they got the information from CNN. And, uh, well, I immediately I thought, well, why are you getting it from CNN? Surely you should be doing your own yeah. investigation. Yeah. And it, it, it just seemed to me that it's it, it, not just Channel 4. They, they all did this to a certain extent. The media kind of distancing themselves um, from responsibility for their own reports, but at the same time almost salivating over this, with glee over this kind of information. Um, and, uh, you know, all the time we've got this situation. I mean, with the story about Charlie Rowley, who has, has been reported today, he's, he's now been discharged. But, I mean, it was over a week ago that they told us that he was talking. Uh, and one would have presumed that the police would have been um, interviewing him and giving us some results. And this is the thing. We never get any concrete Well, results. quite. Uh, I mean, uh, they, they must have known uh, as soon as he was able to talk, they must have known how the perfume bottle uh, got into his house. Yeah. That's the first thing you'd ask him. Yeah, well, you would have thought so, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. But, but we uh, never get any kind of coherent uh, picture of, uh, of what, have, what, what, um, what happened. And, um, well, I, I, I'm com- I've come to the conclusion that this is a deliberate strategy what they, what we've got is this continual drip feeding the public with these sensational, unsubstantiated stories about. Well, Russia. I'm going to give you, you some good news, Sean. Sean, this I'm... overarching narrative of yeah, Russia but I'm but I'm going to give you some good news, Sean. A friend yeah. of mine, uh, a, a, a Washington radio host and TV filmmaker, called yeah. Lee Stranahan, was in Salisbury two days ago, and he was with me last night. He was in Salisbury. He right. interviewed dozens of people and did not find one person, not one person, <laughs> who believed the government's narrative. In Salisbury. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let alone in the major cities. Exactly. Like yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've got to go, Sean. Thanks for your call. Here's Darren in Leeds. Go ahead, Darren. Uh, hi, George. Hi. I'd just like to talk to you about uh, Chuck Luna and how, if you didn't know, during the 2016 election, you know, when WikiLeaks released how the Democrats rigged the election against Bernie. Yes. Well, one Chuck Luna was emailing Hillary Clinton quite often, asking to help get Corbyn out of leadership, and he was offering Hillary advice about how to take down Bernie Sanders, the only Jewish presidential candidate in the history of the United States. Oh, that's you don't hear not Mad the only George one, but the only one running for the Democrats, uh, maybe. Uh, Dr. Jill Stein, who was my candidate, uh, was uh, herself Jewish. But uh, the, the point you make is uh, absolutely accurate, Darren, that the 
conflation or the confluence, rather, uh, between the right wing of the Labour Party, the Blairites, the Brownites, and the corporate Democrats uh, personified by the Clintons is total. It's complete. And it's been decades in the making. And they were as afraid of Sanders as Chuka is afraid of Corbyn. Yeah, because they lose the power if, you know, people like that who at least try and listen to the people who put them in office. But I'd also like to mention, sadly, Bernie's fallen in line a little bit with the Russia scare. But I'd like, well, hopefully if Corbyn it's, can get a hold of him... It's very him diminishing. To, uh, I've been yeah. following uh, how Bernie Sanders is now yeah. on his knees, getting ready to be yeah. on his belly. Uh, to placate and entertain the very people who stole the presidency of the United States from him. It's a very pitiful sight. Darren in Leeds, thank you very much. John Emmett says on the email, George, the world has gone mad. Subri ridicules Mog because he inherited his wealth. Some left-wingers are more right-wing than right-wingers. In the USA, the Democrats have fallen in love with the CIA. My brain hurts. I need an aspirin, uh, John in Lanx. John, first of all, let me tell you, I knew the revolt was over in the House of Commons because I saw Jacob Rees-Mogg at Lord's. And in a rare concession to the summer, he was wearing a straw hat, but it was double-breasted. Wayne Mack for Palestine says, don't forget Sajid David's, ro sorry, Sajid Javid's role in this false anti-Semitism tosh. He came out with a vile tweet yesterday. I'm not going to read any more on that, Wayne, because I feel sure that that is headed for the courts. Here's the legend that is Damien in Brighton. Go ahead, Damien. Good evening, George. Hi. Um, George, I'd like to discuss two important events which happened this week um, that I believe have got grave consequences for uh, the Labour Party and for a Corbyn-led Labour government. Yeah. Now, the first uh, event is of historic importance. Um, yesterday, following the passing of a party, apartheid legislation in the Knesset, um, Israel is now formally an apartheid state. Yes, well, I mean, even the Israeli press, even Haaretz has said exactly that. Yes, it was de facto, uh, and it had apartheid policies. It's now de jour. Now, George, also this week... Um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's a long life, a lifelong anti-apartheid and anti-racist campaigner, was abusively and libelously uh, accused of being a racist in the House of Commons. Yep. Um, now, that's an absurd accusation. Of and course, I she helpfully did it behind the Speaker's chair, but still in the chamber. And the words are thus protected by parliamentary privilege. Quite so, That's why the Jewish Chronicle have got those very words in her quotation marks on their front page today. Quite so. Now, that was an absurd uh, accusation, and the reason I use that word, George, is because the person who was accusing Jeremy Corbyn of being a racist is a registered supporter of an organisation which is a self-declared friend of what is now formally an apartheid state. Quite so. Um, now, you'd expect every single member of the PLP to swing behind Corbyn and defend him on this, George. That's not what happened. Um, I won't go into the names. Uh, the, the normal crew, Wes Streeting, Chukwu Muna, Angela Smith, Liz Kendall, Ben Bradshaw, et al., um, immediately didn't leap to defence of the person being libelled. They leapt to the defence of the, of the libeller. Now, pe the, re um, the listener might be slightly puzzled as to why that is the case. And the, to solve that puzzle for them, every single one of those people I've listed are also members of the LFI, an organisation which is a self-declared friend of apartheid. Now, that kind of... Um, support for that type of organisation might be um, acceptable in the institutionally racist Conservative Party, George, because after all, they did support South African apartheid and Conservatives did call for the hanging of Nelson Mandela. But in my view, it's completely unacceptable for any member of the Labour Party. Yeah, it's, in, it's incompatible or ought to be incompatible. Now, um, uh, you will have heard 
and probably learned uh, just at the same time I yep. did, yep. Uh, that two of the leading uh, members of the Labour Friends of Israel, Ruth Smith and, uh, and the Liverpool Riverside uh, MP, Louise Elman, have tabled an emergency motion for the penultimate evening uh, of Parliament next week, next Monday, yep. uh, which uh, will provide the basis for a rupture in Mike Rosen and my uh, reading. Is that also yours? Uh, yes, George. I mean, in my view, um, I'll be quite clear on this point. Uh, in my view, the attempt to change Labour's standing orders uh, is a naked attempt to suppress free speech in the party and prevent the next Labour government from challenging apartheid. Um, the rules... I think that Chris Williamson made a very strong point on this, um, and that is that the NEC is the supreme body of the Labour Party um, and it's already decided and it's done a lot of work on the um, I, uh, HI, HIRA to, because it was a, quite a vague document and it's really improved it. Um, so we can enter into debates, George, about rules and policies, and you know the Labour rule book better than I, I'm sure. Well, I, I used to know it. It may have changed somewhat. <laughs> exactly. I, it changed I have the... been expelled for the last 15 years. It changes every year, as you know, George. But my point is this. The fundamental question is, is this, is that is the NEC going to allow its sovereignty in the party to be usurped by a small number of individuals who, let's be honest about this, George, have been intentionally sabotaging the electability yes, yes. of the Labour Party. This is the end game, uh, Damien. Either Jeremy Corbyn and the NEC prevail or the parliamentary Labour rebels and the Labour Friends of Israel and Ambassador Mike Re Mark uh, Regev. Either they prevail or Corbyn prevails. Monday is the end game. Thanks for your call. Marie has the last word. Mike Rosen is a wizardly sociolinguist, Chomsky, notwithstanding. Michael Rosen is a genius at cutting through the ideologically charged language used in political discourse and making sense for us. Impeccable. I believe that my interview with Mike Rosen tonight ought to be and probably will travel far and live long. It's been a privilege. Tonight, on the moats, I'll be back, God willing, on Monday at 10 a.m. in the morning. Please join me all week next week. Thank you.